All right. We're going to continue our discussion of power in AC circuits. Last time we talked about the concepts of instantaneous power, average power. We introduced the concept of RMS, right, which makes it really nice when we're dealing with periodic functions because we can describe them in a way that lets us know what the equivalent DC supply voltage would be that would give us the same power, the same average power in the circuit. But now we're going to get a little bit deeper into the concepts of power specifically when applied to AC circuits, right? Because we want to be able to characterize the real portion and the imaginary portion of the expression for power. So apparent power, which we use the symbol S for, right? and, this is an, and this is again where I've said that in the book you have to be really careful with notation because they will use S for mm -hmm. apparent power and then they will use bold S or S with a little vector symbol above it to represent complex power. So be careful. And when we're writing it, it's probably best by hand. If you're doing apparent power, it's S. And when we introduce it in a, in a slide or two, complex power, oftentimes, right, I'll try to remember to write down the vector symbol. Apparent power is the product of the RMS values of voltage and current, right? We, we had an expression for the average power, right? And the average power included this cosine of the, of the difference in the phase angles between the voltage and the current. But the magnitude out front, the piece that looks a lot like our standard power expression, I times V, right? That's what we call apparent power. And if you will, that's basically the maximum value the power could possibly achieve, right? So it's still a nice value to know, because if the theta V minus theta I, if that was, you know, one, or if that was, the difference was zero, so the cosine was one, the power we would get out would be V times I. And again, we're using now this expression of current and voltage in RMS, so that we don't have to worry about the factor of a half that was out front. <coughs> So again, we're assuming in this case, we're also able to assume if it's a sinusoid that that one half was split up. There's that root um, root two underneath of each of the terms when you go to RMS. So that's why that one half is gone. So here, another piece that's a little bit different is now we are not measuring this in watts because apparent power isn't something you measure. You can't put your own your power meter on there and measure the apparent power. So we measure it in volt amps. That's what helps us keep it straight from the average or the real power, which is the thing we measure in watts. Right? Watts are, are actually doing the work. That's real. So if we're calling this magnitude out front the product VIR, VRMS times IRMS, that's S. The cosine of the phase difference is what we know as the power factor. Essentially, it's telling us how much of that apparent power are we actually getting in real power, right? Because that's when I multiply power factor times apparent power, I get the average power, right? So that's a really handy number to know as well. So knowing the apparent power and the power factor tell us a little bit about the way the circuit is built. Again, if something is purely resistive, only resistors in the circuit, then the voltage and the current are going to be in phase with each other. So their difference will be zero. And the cosine of zero is one, so the power factor is one. That's the maximum value the power factor can have. And if I were to look at the average power divided by the apparent power, it's one, right? Because P equals S times the power factor. If power factor is 1, P equals S. What this tells us is that all of the power in our circuit is being consumed, which makes sense, right? The resistors just burn up power. They get hot. And if all I have is resistors, they're just sitting there getting hotter and hotter and hotter. Right? So purely resistive circuits give us a power factor of 1, and they're consuming all of our power. If we look at the purely reactive, so kind of the opposite case, right? where our circuit is made up entirely of inductors and capacitors. Right? If, or 
even uh, purely, let's say, purely inductors or purely capacitors, even, right? Then the phase difference is going to be plus or minus 90 degrees, depending on which one of those we have. Again, because we can look at it, that expression. Remember that little chart, right? We had a little chart that showed inductors, or sorry, resistors, inductors, and capacitors. And we said, oh, well, what's the impedance of each of these? The impedance is R, J omega L, and negative J over omega C, right? And so if this is the impedance, then V equals this times I, right? And so the voltage is 90 degrees ahead. of the current in the inductor. So you have a 90, a positive 90 degree phase shift if it's a purely inductive circuit. So you'd have a, a power factor, you know, the cosine of 90 is zero, right? So your power factor is zero, whether it's inductive or capacitive. But if the phase shift is positive 90, you know it's inductive. In the case of the capacitor, because it's negative J, that's the minus 90. which tells us that the current is 90 degrees ahead of the voltage, right? The current leads the voltage by 90 degrees, which is going to result in a voltage minus current <coughs> phase of negative 90. It's still a power factor of zero, right? But from knowing these two, we could even determine that this is a purely capacitive circuit. So if the power factor is zero, what does that do to the average power? Average power is S times power factor, zero. So nothing is being consumed. No power is being used if our circuit is purely capacitive or purely inductive. Right? So the sinusoidal voltage or current is just moving through our circuit, and it just keeps going. It never disappears. Now, of course, that isn't going to happen in real life because inductors have a little bit of resistance in them. Capacitors have a little bit of resistance in them. So there's always going to be a, even though you don't put a resistor in your circuit, there will always be some small amount of resistive loss. And so gradually power will indeed be consumed. So no perpetual motion machines, right? Superconductors are the one thing that kind of throws a loop, you know, throws us for a loop in that. In a superconductor, you can truly have R equals zero. That's a very special case, right? Resistive and reactive loads. So if we combine the two, so we've got some combination of resistors and inductors, resistors and capacitors, or all three, right? Then obviously our power factor is not going to be zero or one. It's going to be somewhere in between, right? And so we can determine then if the voltage minus, the phase of the voltage minus the phase of the current, if it's greater than zero, right? Then it looks like an inductive load, just like the inductor here, right? If the, if the phase of the voltage minus the phase of the current is positive, we would have had an inductor. So even though it may not be exactly 90, it looks more inductive than anything else. If the phase difference is negative, then we say that this is like a capacitive load, right? Because in this case, the current leads the voltage. So we could have inductors and capacitors there, but again, I talked about that they can kind of cancel each other out and you can end up with sort of a net effective capacitance or a net effective inductance, depending on which one you have more of. 